So our last speaker and last keynote of the day is Jason Tuomi from Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. Jason is a researcher in theoretical physics of quantum science and technology with a focus on hybrid quantum systems, which is essentially talking about how to marry together different types of quantum systems together to achieve functionality, which no one subsystem possesses. Uh, and so Jason is, was appointed the lead to the quantum machines unit at the Okinawa Institute for Science and Technology in 2020. He leads a group of researchers, both from theory and experiment, to develop hybrid quantum systems from quantum sensors, communications, and whatnot. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll give it to Jason, who will be talking to us about magnetic engineered quantum systems for sensing and fundamental studies. Thank you very much, Jason. It's all yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to tell you about our work. Thanks, Gibran, for a fantastic introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's all good. All good. So uh, let's just crack on. So I'm from Okinawa, and I'll tell you a little bit about where that is at the end of the talk. So I'm going to talk, uh, when I give talks, I like to talk about a few things at once. So I'll talk about three types of little projects we've been working on, but they all have to do with sensing. So I'll particularly focus on quantum uh, engineering using magnetic forces. So that uses magnetic fields to manipulate and control the quantum motion of objects. So there's a related field, a much larger field called optomechanics. And that uses optical forces to control and manipulate the motion of objects. So that's a pretty well-developed field, but mag magnetomechanics, which is what we call the field where we use magnetic forces, it's, it's kind of new and uh, people are still getting into it. So uh, why mechanical systems is, it turns out the mechanical degrees of freedom can be made to interact with many other forces. Um, also, uh, it can uh, provide a route to, to develop large macroscopic states, macroscopic quantum cats. Now, um, if you want a sensor, it's very handy to have a, a very high Q resonator. Um, then, of course, then the um, frequency of that is very well defined, and any small change in the frequency due to some effect can be easily sensed. So photonic systems have already developed this, so you can get optical cavities, which are very high Q. The photon bounces many times before it's lost. But what we're interested in is looking at developing a mechanical uh, resonator. So this will be a very high Q motional resonator, and we're going to look at doing that using magnetic levitation and cooling. And the interesting thing is that to do this uh, levitation, for instance, we're going to use magnetic forces which are passive. We don't need to power them. The, the object is naturally levitated and remains levitated forever unless you uh, push it off. So maybe these types of uh, technologies for levitation and trapping, etc., would have lower noise because they're not powered. So the three stories I'll talk about are the magnetic mag a theory work we did a while ago about magnetic levitation uh, and the cooling of a small object. And this will be a superconducting cage. Then we'll show you a little experiment we did where we actually magnetically trapped little diamonds and uh, see how, uh, at what pressure we can get down to when we pump them out. So the lower the pressure, uh, the less damping there is, and therefore the more, um, higher Q they are. And finally, quantum sensing. So we're interested quite a lot in building quantum sensors. And we'll see there's different uh, uh, scalings of the precision depending on the resources. Uh, one is called the shot noise and the other one is Heisenberg. And the question is, can we go beyond the Heisenberg? Can we get uh, better precision quickly? Okay, so let's start with the first little story magnetic levitation uh, and cooling of a small object. So I mentioned that we're interested in mechanical degrees of freedom. Uh, some people are talking about spin or photons, but we're interested in mechanics. So there's three main reasons for this is that, uh, well, first of all, there's a reason for fundamental science. Can you build quantum superpositions of very large objects? Second one, 
Enhanced quantum sensors, because these mechanical degrees of freedom can be made to feel all sorts of things like electrical forces, magnetic forces, inertial forces, uh, can they be used as sensors? And that also brings you to the third one, because they feel all sorts of forces, they can be used as sort of conduits in quantum systems to couple various other systems together. So they're like a toolbox. And on the right there, you can see a whole variety of resonators going from tiny ones all the way up to big ones, from picograms up to kilograms. So fundamental quantum science, um, on the left here, you see a fuzzy molecule. So people have uh, essentially interfered individual molecules. So this uh, weekly line here, this oscillating line, is the experimental signature of the interference of the matter wave of individual molecules. So this is about as large an object as people have been able to show quantum properties of the motion of the object. Uh, but if you could, for instance, in the bottom panel here, produce a superposition of two objects, so one can explore um, quantum gravity. So is gravity quantum? Can gravity itself entangle objects? Now, to do that, uh, we're treating gravity, um, well, yeah, sort of semi-classically because we're not considering the quantized nature of gravity, but we're just asking, can gravity, can space-time be in a superposition so that, um, the, so for instance, the position of two uh, objects can be entangled. So the middle one is a quantum sensor where you have uh, a carbon nanotube, and this oscillates and it's extremely uh, light. So um, it turns out one can use this to sense the change in mass of this nanotube by looking at the change in oscillation frequencies. And you can get down to a resolution where the mass of this nanotube changes by something called a yachtogram. Never heard of that before. It's 10 to the minus 24 over gram, so extremely sensitive. And on the right here, we have two examples of using mechanics as a sort of toolbox which connects up other quantum systems together. The top one here uh, is you have buried nitrogen vacancy centers um, which are far apart from each other and you'd like to connect them up. Well, they can't talk to each other directly, they're too far apart, but essentially you can use mechanical oscillators that have little magnets at the end of them to uh, essentially couple them together even though they're far apart. And the one in the bottom is a paper which she proposes a way to couple coherently microwave information to optical information uh, using a mechanical membrane which oscillates back and forth. It, one side of it is, is one end of a mirror and the other side is the one end of an electrical capacitor in the electrical microwave superconducting circuit. Okay, so there's a few reasons why we're interested in mechanical systems, but most of these we're going to be interested in having ones which have as little damping as possible. That means as high a quality factor. Quality factor is the description of how many times the oscillator can oscillate before it gets down the way. So we want as high as lowest damping as possible, and we want a high an oscillation frequency as possible so that we can cool it. So one idea is to use superconducting systems because essentially they have a, a zero electrical dissipation. So can we use that for a levitated mechanical resonator? So here's a, a little demo now. Let's see if I can get this, this for you. Here, let me show this to you. And yeah, maybe you can see it here. So this is just uh, a little demo you might already have done in, in university. Or so this is super large eddy turn tubes. So what we're doing is we're dropping a very, very powerful magnet, a neodymium magnet through a copper tube. Uh, the copper tube is not ferromagnetic. It, the magnet won't stick to the copper, but let's just see what happens when he drops it down uh, through the copper tube. That took a long time. As you can see, it barely falls. Now an aluminum tube is scared, not ferromagnetic. Yeah, but it takes a long time for it to come through.
And so now we're going to put on a, a little film there, which shows you the magnetic field as the magnet drops. And as you can see, it's dropping. So that's eddy currents. So if you've done this in your physics, as the magnet falls, it uh, the moving magnetic field causes eddy currents in the metal, whose action is to oppose the motion that caused them. And the motion that caused them is the, is the magnet dropping. And so the eddy currents tries to very hard to stop the magnet from dropping. So let's go back and have a look at, um, no, not that one. So let's go a bit further and develop that idea a bit. So let's have a look at um, this example here on the left. This is a slice of a vertical plane. So up is, is the vertical direction and, and, and the horizontal is the horizontal direction. Let's call um, at a particular, above a particular height, there's a magnetic field coming out of the page, very strong magnetic field. And below this height, there's no magnetic field. And let's put a wire loop here, which is initially at rest. And then we let it go. Now, the only force acting on it is initially gravity. So it'll start to fall. But as it falls, it, it starts, the magnetic flux going through this will change. And therefore, just as we saw in that video, eddy currents will build up in this loop to oppose that change in motion. And so it'll slow down. So you can work out the equation of motion. Here's the velocity. It's a bit of a strange equation because this is third order in the position. This is a differential equation, which is third order in the position, which I find very unusual. Never really see this in mechanics. Then there is a frequency of oscillation, um, uh, which is related to the strength of the magnetic field. And there's a force down, which is gravity, and there's some damping force. So this is a damped force harmonic oscillator. And uh, you can now plot the equation to this, and here's now position. So we started off at zero position, and it goes negative as it falls. And if we choose a, a wire with large resistance, we can see it starts to, starts to fall, but eddy currents stop it and bring it back up again, or try to, but they can't make it all the way because there's some resistance. And eventually, it eventually falls. So if we now go to uh, a, a case where there's even lower resistance, then it, it oscillates a bit more and slowly, more slowly falls. So the, the, the next thing is I'll go to a superconducting loop. And in the superconducting loop, it doesn't fall. It just oscillates. And the frequency at which it oscillates is related to the, the degree of inhomogeneity or anisotropy of the magnetic field. Now, uh, if since this is just a little wire loop, it's not completely stable. So we'll go to a more stable configuration. And in that case, we have three non-intersecting wire superconducting loops. This is what we call a little cage. It has uh, dimensions, which is say one micron by 10 by 10. And then we're going to stick it next to a small permanent magnet. And that has very large inhomogeneous magnetic fields next to it. And so if I put that little cage there, it, it's actually trapped there, if this is a superconducting cage. And if it tries to move in any direction, uh, the flux through it, the magnetic flux through the, any of these loops will change and the eddy currents will be made, which brings it back. So it's completely trapped. And you can work out the various oscillation frequencies in this graph here on the bottom left. Uh, you can see the oscillation frequencies can be up to a megahertz, which is actually fairly high for a large system, this me mechanical oscillation. So what's going to slow this oscillation down? Um, what's going to damp the motion? So it turns out there's a few uh, phenomena that'll damp the motion. Uh, if we make this out of a, a type two superconducting material, uh, magnetic flux isn't completely uh, eliminated from it. It can actually slowly make its way through it. So there's not a perfect Meissner effect, but that turns out to be a very small damping. Most of the damping comes from little eddy currents being generated in this magnetic sphere due to the oscillations of this cage. Uh, and also due to residual gas collisions, you can get a very high ultra high vacuum, but not an absolutely perfect vacuum. 
So it turns out you can get rid of the eddy damping in this sphere by having uh, a magnet, which is a complete electrical insulator. Um, yes, we didn't really understand that those things existed, but they do. And a material called yttrium iron garnet, which is a gig, is uh, a ferromagnet, which is a crystal, which is uh, an insulator. So if you use such a magnet, you can get very high emotional cues, we predict, 10 to the 9, which is almost better than any optical resonator. Now, how to cool it? What we do is we couple it to this little thing on the bottom, this little ring with three, three red dots. This is our graphical in, uh, interpretation of something known as a superconducting flux qubit. Now, in superconducting quantum computing, there's various types of qubits. This is one type of qubit. And in this type of qubit, there's, we have this ring, and there's currents that flow in the ring. And these can be very large currents, hundreds and thousands of nanoamps. And they'll either flow clockwise or counterclockwise in this ring. And because it's a quantum ring, it can be in superposition, both clockwise and counterclockwise. These circulating currents can produce large magnetic fields, which are actually quantum magnetic fields because they can be in superposition of up or down. So uh, these magnetic fields will inductively couple to the motion of this oscillating superconductor, superconducting cage. So there's a coupling between essentially the magnetic inductor coupling between the motion of this cage and this superconducting qubit. And once we have that, we can figure out a way to cool it. So here's the Hamiltonian we have. We have A plus A dagger is the cup, the position of that cage, that levitated cage. Sigma Z is the qubit uh, the, the operator indicating the, this, this qubit. And actually for this cooling, we want a very bad qubit that decays very quickly. So we can essentially couple the qubit with this resonator and cool its motion uh, down to almost one phonon. So this is the, the one of the very first works that looked at using static magnetic fields to trap and then cool quantum objects back in 2012. As with Maro, who's now in China, and Gavin, who's in Australia. So, um, Right, that's the first little story. And after magnetic magnetomechanics, one can develop all sorts of other applications. So with uh, Matthias and Gavin, we looked at uh, putting this ring, this yellow ring here on the left in a superposition of two heights. Uh, and this essentially allows us to uh, measure gravitational forces uh, absolutely. Then we can use uh, magnetomechanics to do spin squeezing to get extremely large squeezing for a collection of spins. Or we can try and achieve ultra strong coupling between uh, two types of oscillators. The top oscillator here is a spring oscillator with a magnet on, on it and an LC circuit, which is an electrical oscillator. The interesting thing about this thing on the right, this little uh, story on the right, and that's with Eric, Warwick, and Michael, is that the, the, the oscillator, the LC oscillator, is only coupled to the moving magnet when the magnet moves. Uh, if the magnet is stationary, there's no coupling because to get some flux going, uh, to get some current going through the LC circuit, you have to have a uh, changing flux. So this is an example where you have momentum coupling between the two harmonic oscillators. Okay, so and now quite a few other people now around the world have gotten into looking at using magnetic fields for quantum mechanics. So then we decided to try a little experiment. So, um, so this involves levitating systems. And now uh, we want to have levitated systems because we don't want them attached so we have an oscillator that oscillates some, somewhere. If it's attached mechanically to a substrate or some other um, superstructure, that, me that mechanical attachment will essentially have some loss. So to eliminate that loss, we trap the object in 3D. So there's various uh, proposals and work going on around the world to trap objects in 3D, large objects. Uh, so here's one which uses three lasers large lasers uh, to uh, essentially bounce off a, a convex mirror to levitate the convex mirror. This involves extremely large laser powers, which heats up that top mirror a lot. Then you can use uh, optical tweezers. Uh, and uh, again, this uses large laser powers to trap that little dielectric particle at the waist of the beam. 
One can use electrodynamic traps, but there you have a mass of particles exactly in the center, some micro motion. So the thing we liked is lev magnetic levitation. So here's an example from 1997 from Barry and Geim where they levitated a frog. So that frog was alive and it's using diamagnetic levitation. And the familiar one here is Meissner repulsion where you put a little magnet above a superconductor and it just floats there. So uh, in the optical tweezer trap, essentially uh, you can have a very high oscillation frequency. So the dielectric particle is attracted to the, the intense part of the beam. If the particle leaves, it, it, it comes back again. And so it's like on a little spring. So people have trapped uh, silicon dioxide and diamond nanoparticles in such traps. Um, and more recently, they managed to build these little dumbbells and then uh, rotate them up to extremely fast speeds, several gigahertz. We can also have trapping of individual nanodiamonds, which have an NV center, and then you can see the fluorescence of the NV center inside the levitated laser trapped nanodiamond. But there was problems. Those, those laser tweezers had the advantage of very high oscillation frequencies, about 100 kilohertz. However, because of the large laser powers, if your particle had any tiny amount of absorption of that laser power, it would just burn. And it's very, it proved to be impossible to have diamond trapped in such tweezers. Diamond house has some bits of graphite and it's, no matter how hard you clean it, there's other impurities and diamond eventually burns. So also because you've got large laser powers, there might be some all sorts of heating and noise and it's also powered. So what we want to do is have a look at the recent results that people used to trap using a whole bunch of different methods, little diamond particles or little silicon particles. And here's a graph of various results published where they don't use any cooling. So they're just putting the particle and they try to reduce the pressure. And they found that after they reduce the pressure beyond a certain value, the particle escaped the trap and you, it just left. And without using uh, lots of other methods to try and keep the particle there dynamically, like cooling, you couldn't cool down, you couldn't remove the gas from the chamber and keep the particle. So what we want to do is try and see what, how our results compare to this. Uh, we want to see how we can cool, the, uh, essentially uh, reduce the pressure of, of the chamber and keep the particle trapped and not let it escape. So if we can get down to ultra high vacuums, then we expect the, the emotional degree, emotional um, Q will go up to 10 to the 10, which is extremely large. So we want to find results in towards this region where you have large center mass frequencies, which is megahertz, here's 10 to the five is 100 kilohertz, and at very low pressures. That's where you'd like to go. So we're gonna use, diamagnetic trapping. And uh, so essentially, if you have a particle with a density rho and a magnetic susceptibility chi, then you could work out that the acceleration felt by that particle in a magnetic field B is related to this formula here, where you have grad of B squared. Now let's assume B just varies linearly with the height Z. Then you can show, plug it back into this formula, that the acceleration in Z goes linearly with Z. So that's like a harmonic oscillator, only if the sine of chi is negative. So that means the material has to be diamagnetic. So diamagnetic have negative magnetic susceptibilities. Now this frog floated because water actually is, has a negative uh, magnetic susceptibility. If you uh, essentially uh, have water dripping from a, a tap, and you bring a very strong magnet to it, it will be pushed away. So uh, graphite has a very large, my, uh, is a very large uh, negative diamagnetic material. And here's an example where you have it floating above a magnet. So uh, typically, however, this frequency of oscillation omega m is very small because the magnetic susceptibilities of normal materials is very small. So we have to compensate by having very large gradient magnetic fields. So to do that, we uh, looked at this configuration down here in the left, bottom left. We had two magnets, which are very small cylinders, which we sharpened into very sharp points. 
and north versus are, are brought next to north. So they're repelling each other very strongly, but we just bring them together. And so the magnetic field changes very quickly over this distance between the gaps of the tips. And so we bring the tips within 30 or 40 microns of each other. And so the magnetic field in the top magnet is one Tesla at the tip, and at the bottom it's minus one Tesla. And so it changes from one Tesla down to minus one Tesla over a few tens of microns. So the magnetic radiant is very high, 10 to the five Tesla per meter. And so you can work out that if I trap a little diamond there, uh, it'll have an oscillation frequency of about 400 hertz, which is not small, but not great. Uh, sorry, uh, and for graphite, it can be up to uh, kilohertz, which is much higher. So this are very much lower oscillation frequencies than in the optical traps, but still not too small. So this is with James, uh, PhD student Stephen, and um, master student Matthew back in Australia. So we did that, and then we uh, built this experiment where we put uh, this magnetic trap in a vacuum chamber. We had it, uh, the particle illuminated. It's trapped in between the tips. Goes through a microscope objective, through some cleaning optics, and then uh, a beam sitter so we can look at it with a camera. And here's the camera image here. And then what we do is we look at the image of this particle and we send all the light from the bottom half of this ring to one photodiode and all the light from the top half of this ring to another photodiode and we subtract the two signals from the photodiode, which gives us a differential reading of the height of this particle in this image. And that has very high bandwidth and so we can get very accurate uh, position measurements at a very high rate. So. Uh, now there's this is essentially Brownian motion because the particle is held there by a by this magnetic trap, but it's also being kicked around by the gas particles in the chamber. And so this is Brownian motion of a large particle. And the differential equations for this which are well known. We have the damped harmonic oscillator, and we have some forcing. Both the damping and the forcing are due to the gas particles. And this forcing term here on the right is, is stochastic noise, which is related to the uh, damping rate and the temperature and the mass of the object. So it's all very well understood. And you can work out theoretically what the, if you, uh, the power spectral density of the oscillations are, it's, it's this Lorenzian. And you can work out something known as the mean square deviation, which uh, theoretically you can have these different curves. So this is from a paper back in science in 2010. This linear part is just due to normal unbounded Brownian motion, but because it's in a trap, it can't go spread forever. It has to stop spreading. And that's where, it, because that's the width of the trap. And if you have very high damping, say at atmosphere, you have this red curve, which has a very little amount of oscillation at the very top. But as you bring the pressure down, you start getting more oscillation as the particle starts to oscillate for longer and longer. So there's nice theoretical predictions for this power spectral density and this mean square deviation. So let's have a look at our results. So we measured both of these. Here's the power spectral densities. The red are the theory curves and the blue are the experiments with some errors. So but on the left graph is the high pressure and you can see there's these spikes here, which are due to um, systematic noise, pumps in the, in the, in, in the experiment, etc. There's no sign of any particles resonance around uh, two or 300 hertz. It's too damped, over damped. So as we bring the pressure down, the middle one has a lower pressure, the damping is reduced and we begin to see the formation of this uh, resonance peak, which is still broad and it's around 400 hertz. Um, but uh, we can make it much, more sharp by bringing the pressure down even further. And now we have a very sharp uh, resonance line at the trap, and there's more resonance lines here, and you can see due to the vibrations of the other directions of the particle. So using all those theoretical uh, formula, you can work out the oscillation frequency here. It's 300, 400, and 410. As you notice, as we ring, bring the pressure down, the oscillation frequency of the trap is increasing, which is uh, a bit strange. Um, the temperature is also increasing, and that tells you a little bit what's going on. The particle is diamond, it's, it's in a magnetic trap, but we have used light to illuminate it, but it's very weak light, so it doesn't heat up a lot, but it does heat up to five or 600 Kelvin. 
And it turns out that diamond uh, has a magnetic susceptibility which changes with temperature. So yes, unfortunately, our trap frequency will depend on the temperature of the diamond. So that's kind of interesting. So if we really go to very low vacuum, then we get a very sharp resonance and we can predict some estimates for the motional Q around 10 to the six. So uh, our results fall down here. We got to very low pressures. We still have a kind of low center mass frequency, but the particle stayed there for months. It didn't escape and uh, we had no uh, electrical currents on or power to trap that particle for months. So as we bring the pressure down, however, um, we possibly will need to cool it. And if we can get to ultra high, ultra high vacuums, we would have an emotional Q of 10 to the 10. So that was back in 2019. So the next step would be to uh, cool the motion uh, and to, uh, as you notice, there was quite a lot of noise in some of these plots, especially here. That's possibly due to vibration. And so these were didn't really have any vibration isolation. So we'll do lots of vibration isolation. And this is what we're now working on in Japan. So, okay, so that was the end of the second story. Uh, do I still have some time? Okay. Quantum sensing. So the last story is, can we go beyond Heisenberg scaling? So we have about 20 um, minutes for the talk. Sorry. We have about okay. 20 minutes for the talk. Thank you. Great. So, so the last little story I'll talk about is persistent sensing. So this is a, a huge topic um, internationally. People use sensors for all sorts of industrial applications. Um, so I'll be talking about sensing of magnetic fields. So there's uh, a long history of knowing what the strength of magnetic fields are. So here I'll just summarize some of the physics that people use to measure magnetic fields. And some of them are based on quantum. First one is a superconducting quantum in interference device, SQUID, so definitely quantum. Uh, this operates at a few Kelvin, so it's very low temperature, but it can get down to a precision of magnetic field sensing, which is extremely low, 50 femtotesla per root hertz. So essentially you can determine your magnetic field to this precision. So uh, very small. Femta Tesla is 10 to the minus 15 of a Tesla. So another way of measuring magnetic fields is having a, a, a an optical resonator whose frequency depends on mag magnetic fields. So you can do that by doping your, your optical resonator. This is a toroidal resonator. So the light is circulating in this donut. This is a false colored image. Uh, you dope it by putting some uh, magne magnetostrictive material on this, on this resonator, and that will essentially cause the resonator to expand or contract when there's a magnetic field nearby. And that changes the optical frequency of this resonator by vast amounts. So you can get down to fairly low precisions, but not as low as a squid. Then you can use uh, magneto resistance. So you can build uh, uh, heterostructures, different layers of materials, that uh, have changes uh, the resistance by large amounts when you have magnetic fields. So um, as you can see here, this GMR uh, sensor is pretty big actually. Then there's the diamond. Diamond has a nitrogen vacancy center in it, which is a substitutional defect, um, which uh, it can be used as a tiny magnetometer, which has an atomic spatial dimension. So it's extremely small uh, spatially, and that can get down to a precision measuring magnetic field of about a pico tesla. So then there's a theoretical prediction of using a laser. So a laser has, if you pump a laser uh, below threshold, it doesn't really have lasing action, but above threshold, the output of the laser goes up and up and up expand exponentially fast. So at this particular threshold, um, there's a, a, the, the, lasing, the lasing phenomena is very sensitive to all the parameters in the system. So they proposed using this phenomena of this exponential onslaught 
onset of lasing to measure magnetic fields. And they predicted they could get down even better than the squid. And this is nice in that this is at room temperature. Faraday rotation is a phenomena where the polarization of light rotates to, when you have a certain type of optical material, that, which is optically active, and the magnetic field will cause the polarization to rotate. So you can get down to, again, predicted very low, low uh, magnetic fields. Uh, and one interesting application for this is um, uh, magneto and encephalography. So here's the picture on the right of someone wearing a helmet with in it implanted in the helmet are atomic magnetometers using rubidium, hot rubidium vapors. So if people have brain injury or they have something, some tumors, uh, and you don't want to actually expose them to x-rays or, or invasive surgery, you would like to image what's going on inside the brain completely passively. And you can do that by looking at the magnetic fields generated by neurons firing in the brain. And to do that, you have to use very, very sensitive magnetometers. So uh, here, is, here it is, it's called magnetoencephalography. And here is the conventional machine on the left. The poor patient has to sit in a chair with their head inside this machine. And this machine has got uh, a helmet built into it. And in that helmet is an array of squids, which are surrounding the person's head the squids are sitting only a millimeter away from the person's skull or a scalp, and they are held at cryogenic temperatures. So this whole chamber above the person's head is circulating with liquid helium. So these machines are extremely expensive. Australia only had one, and it's the only one in the Southern Hemisphere. So, uh, but people have now figured out in the last few years how to replace this expensive machine with this little helmet full of uh, op, uh, quantum magnetometers. Here's another example here on the right. Uh, if you want to know where you are in the world, then you look at your phone and your phone will tell you because it has GPS in it. But that GPS uses the satellites. But how do you find yourself where you are without using satellites? Well, uh, you have to use a map. And one interesting map is a magnetic map of the earth. So people have made very detailed magnetic maps of the world down to scales of meters. So if you have a magnetometer, this is a vector magnetometer, this top box made from diamond, uh, then by just moving that magnetometer around and mapping out your local area, you can match up with this map and find out where you are without looking at the sky, without using satellites. So it's kind of interesting. Gravimetry uses, uh, there's lots of uses for gravimetry. Um, and how do you do it? That's measuring the local acceleration due to gravity traditional way is you just let something fall and measure how long it takes to fall a certain distance. So this is called a falling corner cube gravimeter. And essentially it uses uh, an interferometer where which part of the interferometer uses a prism, which is at the top of this evacuated tube, which is let fall. And you time how long it takes to fall to the bottom using an atomic clock, which is in this box. Then once it's, once it's fallen, you pick it back up again and you let it fall again. So it takes a, a, just repeat that. So it's a very kind of rough way of measuring a, the local acceleration due to gravity. Here's an atomic gravimeter where essentially it's a small box where you split groups of atoms into two positions and bring them back together again. And they interfere and they can give you an ex, a reading, a measurement of the acceleration of gravity. And these can be now made portable. Why would you be interested in measuring gravity? So here's an example on the right of using uh, gravimetry to measure the motion of water under the continent of India as, it, as water is moving around. So yeah, water is very important. Knowing where it is and how to get it is pretty important and how to conserve it. So yeah, by measuring, water, by measuring gravity, if water is moving, it changes the local gravity. And so you can map out gravity so you can map out the flow of water by mapping out how the surface gravity is changing in time. Here's a picture on the right, on the left, by where they're looking at how ice is ice is changing over Greenland over time by mapping out how gravity is changing. Now, how, what's involved in precision sensing? So all of this involves quantum sensing. So in quantum sensing, you here's the typical paradigm. You have on the box on the top left. 
uh, you prepare some quantum state, rho, then it undergoes some change due to some parameter phi, and rho of phi comes out, and then you have to measure it and repeat this many times to estimate what the phi of phi is. And when you do this measurement, you get a whole bunch of different data, and they're slightly spread because there's errors, etc. And from this histogram, you have to get a good estimate of what that value of phi, that parameter is. Now, in the box in the middle here, um, essentially, uh, if you have a response, this measurement detection, if this response changes with the value of phi, so for instance, um, I have a response that looks like a sine wave with the value of phi. If I sit at the value of phi at pi, then we see here tiny little changes in phi will be reflected in very large changes in the response i. We say that this little point here, that phi is equal to pi, is a sweet spot for very large measurement precisions. If I put phi equal to pi over two, then changes in phi would barely give any change in response i. So there's cer certain types of sweet spots which give you a very sensitive sensor. And now there's a whole different, four different paradigms to do quantum sensing. So, and they're uh, summarized in this top right box. So for for instance, I can make uh, a series of preparations in parallel, each one of them suffering a, a change phi, and I measure each of them separately. This is called classical, classical, classical prepare and classical measure. Or I can have some operation which entangles them all before I measure them. So that's a quantum measurement. Or I can entangle them after I've prepared them, which is a quantum preparation, or I can do both. I can quantum prepare and quantum measure. And then finally, if I have a look at the bottom right here, if I have a probability distribution, which is very sharp, and it changes a lot when there's a small change of parameter, this, this last bottom right one is a, a pretty good uh, measurement scenario because any small change in this position of this distribution, I could sense. Whereas the one on the right here, it's a very broad distribution, I can't sense that change very well. So the things interesting here is the total time it takes to do the measurement, the number of systems used, and the number of repetitions. So the, from information theory, there is some formula for classical information on what's the precision I can get down to, the imprecision. And uh, this is the kramer rao bound. It's the imprecision in phi goes as one over the square root of the number of repetitions times this thing called f which is the Fisher information, which you can get. Here's the formula for it. If you know the probability distribution for getting the result X, given the parameter value of phi. So this is the Fisher information and here's Rao, here's Kramer and here's Fisher. Now there's a quantum version of this and here it is up in this box with quantum Fisher information is given by the trace of rho L squared, where L is uh, this formula here is called the symmetric logarithmic derivative. So on the left of this formula, we have the derivative of the density matrix with respect to this parameter phi. And on the right, we have this um, anti-commutator between this operator L and rho. Turns out that if a lot of cases we're interested in changes in the density matrix, which are unitary. So here the density matrix is changing by a unitary operation, which depends on some parameter phi. And in that case, this formula gets very simple. Uh, and essentially, you can get something looking like an uncertainty relation here. So uh, in the case where the, the change is not unitary, then the formula is very hard to compute. So uh, yeah, people avoid that. Okay, so we have the quantum Fisher information, F of Q, and the classical inf Fisher information, which is just F. So uh, the larger the fish quantum Fisher information is, the more precise, I can estimate the parameter. So let's have a look at some examples. Let's consider a harmonic oscillator. And we put this, we have the harmonic oscillator in some coherent state. So on the right, I've got the phase space of the harmonic oscillator. The horizontal is position, the vertical is momentum. And this coherent state looks like a round blob. So if that blob rotates a little bit in, in the phase space by delta theta, turns out I can estimate theta um, with uh, imprecision, del squared of theta, go, which goes as one over n bar, which n bar is the uh, occupation of the coherent state. 
And there, you notice here, there's a square root in the denominator. So the imprecision doesn't grow very quickly, doesn't, isn't reduced very quickly by having this coherent state get, get larger and larger energy. This is known as the standard quantum limit. But we can improve on that by going to something called a squeeze state, where I now put this coherent state at the origin and squash it a bit. Now, if it's squashed, as you can see, if I rotate it, we should be able to, the state becomes kind of orthogonal pretty quickly because it's very thin. And it turns out now the imprecision in estimating this small rotation angle goes as one over n instead of one over square root of n. So I can now measure angles, this rotation angle delta theta, uh, more accurately with, with the same resources. Before I could only do it with square root of n, but now I can do it with one over n. This is known as the Heisenberg limit. So the question is, can I do better than this? If I have access to a unitary that goes like e to the i theta n squared, before I had e to the i theta n, but if I have e to the i e to the n squared, well, we have a nonlinear uh, evolution of this coherent state. And you can show that the imprecision scales now is one over n to the three halves, which is faster than n. So this is sometimes known as beyond Heisenberg limit uh, and metrology. And this was first proposed in 2004. So um, it would be very interesting to try and get towards this regime um, as you can get to the same imprecision with fewer numbers of resources. And for us, it'll be the energy of the photons. Now let's have a look at what people have done experimentally. So there's a very nice article here in 2018 which summarized a bunch of experiments. This is the number of particles in the experiment on horizontal and the top is essentially the imprecision the noise. Heisenberg limit is this line. We see only these starred experiments are near that Heisenberg limit. And these are for individual trapped ions. The Bose-Einstein condensates sit around here and groups of cold thermal atoms sit around here. And some of them have very large squeezing. So this is this experiment by Kasevich, where he uh, had a very large number of atoms trapped in an optical cavity with a very large squeezing. Okay, so here's a very few examples where we can get, let me skip over this one, beyond Heisenberg uh, uh, scaling. Here's an experiment from 2011, uh, which essentially uh, was essentially squeezing atoms using uh, um, uh, non-classical light to have a, a scaling of the imprecision, which went faster than Heisenberg. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's also possible to uh, do this uh, using nonlinear uh, classical interferometers, sorry, nonlinear interferometers. Here's an atomic interferometer where the top one, top beam sitter, was a nonlinear interferometer. So uh, this is from 2010. And here the imprecisions were slightly better than Heisenberg. So that's as far as I found. Uh, very few experiments have gone beyond the Heisenberg scaling limit. So, but let's have a look how they did it in this last experiment in that they used a nonlinear beam sitter. And this seems to tell you that you need to have some nonlinearity to get beyond Heisenberg scaling. So the question we asked is, is there any way to craft a nonlinear Hamiltonian from linear ones? So that seems a bit uh, impossible. So maybe if you use measurements, because measurements are very nonlinear things in quantum mechanics. Can we use measurements to give us nonlinear Hamiltonians from linear Hamiltonians? So this is work with Mateus, Pablo, Raphael, and others, and uh, published recently. So the question is, can we craft a nonlinear Hamiltonian from a linear one? So we want some magic way of going from this unitary, e to the minus i theta n, n is the rotation, uh, n is the number operator of the harmonic oscillator, to e to the i theta n squared, where you actually don't know what theta is. So it seems like it's uh, not going to be possible, but obviously it is, or else I wouldn't be here giving you this talk. So the advantage of this is that um, the QFI, the quantum Fisher information for this scales as n squared, but this scales as n cubed. And the bigger you get, the better the, the, better the precision that you can get. Now, why you think this might be possible is you look at this integral. This is a very well-known integral from uh, high school or university. It's Gaussian integral. 
And here we're integrating this, this exponential. And let's have a look at the expo exponents. Here's this minus ay squared and plus by. And we notice that b is multiplying the, the coefficient, which is linear in the exponent. But when I do this Gaussian integral, I end up with this answer on the right. And now b is quadratic in the exponent. Here on the left, it was linear. And on the right, it's quadratic. So by doing this Gaussian integral, I've bumped up the power of b in the exponent from linear to quadratic. Now, if we could do this for operators, then I possibly could just uh, essentially square the exponent in my unitary, go from e to the minus i theta n to e to i theta n squared. So I, I don't have much time to show you how we did this, but essentially we used two optical modes and we had the first one called the ancilla in the vacuum state, and we did some squeezing and some shearing. We had another one known as the probe, which comes in also turns out to be in the coherent state. And we have a conditional uh, operation here. Uh, and then we'd measure. And if you go through all of this, I'll just skip to uh, the results. We measure this. Uh, the state that you have here turns out to be because of this integral, um, essentially um, a, 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 an n squared e to the minus i n squared acting on this initial state alpha. So this looks like a Kerr operation acting on alpha. So with this Kerr, however, comes some random noise. And this noise, um, because of measurement noise, we, turns out since we know what the measurement is, we can correct it. And once you correct it, it turns out you can get an almost pure nonlinear operation, a Kerr operation acting on this unit of this initial state. And once you have a Kerr operation, you can make non-classical states like a cat state or a compass state. And so we showed how you can get a cat state, that's this one, or a compass state, which has lots of interesting Wigner functions um, when you, you use our protocol. Finally, we can try and use this to measure uh, an unknown parameter in the circuit, for instance, the amount of rotation. And when you do that, you can find out that the quantum Fisher information scales better than Heisenberg. So um, it, it seems like we can improve and we can essentially boot up powers of, of uh, exponents of operations and get beyond Heisenberg metrology. So here I am at OIST, and this is what the university campus looks like. Here's some coral reefs next door to it. Here's some beautiful blue sea, surfing and, and snorkeling every weekend. Um, do I have a, here's the group um, at, at OIST. Can I have a few seconds to show a quick video? Please. Okay, okay, let's have a look at this. Yeah, that would be right. Oh, wait a minute, I have to switch uh, slides. That's the student housing. Students all live on campus. It's in the jungle in the middle of Okinawa. That's the student housing. That's the ocean. It's all the different labs. So this is we're going in, up the elevator. Beautiful views, nice and warm. Eager students doing experiments, atomic experiments, clean room experiments, soccer experiments, robotics, getting some exercise. Some theoretical physics on the window. And 
that was the liquid video. I think the soccer experiment looked like the double slit experiment. Oh, yes, they were slightly bunched. <laughs> bunched. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you for the talk. Uh, again, anyone, if you have a question, please do write it in the Zoom chat window and we'll be able to go through them one by one. I am online most of the time, and so I'd be very happy to chat about anything all the time, most of the time. So if anyone has any uh, questions or ideas, just, just give me a, a buzz. So we are nearly out of time as well. So if, in case there are no questions, we'll call it a day. Uh, last chance, anyone, if you've got questions. So thank you again, Jason, for a wonderful talk. And the video was really cool. Hopefully, we'll be able to visit you there soon. Hopefully. I thank hope so, too. <laughs> thank you very much. OK. Bye for now. And thank good you night very much. and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. This is the end of the Bye second now. day. And hopefully, we'll have a wonderful day three as well tomorrow. See you then. Goodbye.